Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Adrian Brown. I'm the Executive Director of the Centre for Public Impact and welcome uh, to this fourth in the series this year of the Reimagining Government webinar series with uh, ANZOG and CPI. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of all the lands on which participants in this webinar find themselves. And I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and any other Aboriginal elders with us today. And for our friends in New Zealand, uh, Ena Mana, Ena Reo, Ena Karunga Tangamaha, Tena Koto Katoa. Uh, so it's a real pleasure and a, uh, an honor to be, uh, to be hosting today. Uh, this topic of learning in government is one of the core topics that we explore at CPI. Uh, and as it said in the in the description for this session, in a, in a complex world, in a changing world, in a world where we can't uh, create perfect solutions, uh, especially in, for the complex challenges that we are trying to tackle in government. And as policymakers, learning is an absolutely essential capability, uh, individually, organizationally, and for systems. Uh, but we do know that in government, learning is particularly hard. Uh, for a whole variety of reasons, which I'm sure we'll cover as part of, of this seminar. Uh, but in particular, uh, the structural nature, the siloed nature of, of government and public service can, can hold learning back. So the cultural aspects of public service can hold learning back. Uh, simply uh, the difficulty that we face uh, personally and institutionally acknowledging failure, of course, uh, can hold learning back. So given that learning is so important, uh, but but so difficult, especially within government. How can we uh, overcome that? What can we do uh, to try and build a better learning culture? Uh, so that's the topic for today's uh, discussion. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, briefly just uh, welcome the panelists who'll be joining. We've got three excellent panelists with us today, and then I will um, I'll, I'll invite them to introduce themselves more fully when we kick off the discussion. Uh, but the three panelists we have are Angie Tangiere, who's uh, Katoho Tangata Wenua at Auckland uh, Co-Design Lab. We've got Nairal Nyon, who's uh, lawyer and human rights advocate, and Oli Pekahainen, who's Director General of the International Baccalaureate Organization. Uh, and as I say, I'll give them a chance to introduce themselves uh, more fully in a second. Uh, the overview uh, for and format for this webinar is that we this is recorded, uh, so I just want to make sure everyone uh, everyone's aware of that. We will be publishing uh, the recording uh, with captions uh, when we've uh, finished. The format is a question and answer, uh, so I'll be asking a few questions of the panelists to kick us off. But we do encourage you uh, to use the Q and A function in uh, within Zoom uh, to ask questions throughout the webinar. And we'll be following those questions and hopefully we'll be able to feed those into the discussion and then we'll be uh, looping uh, back to them uh, at the end. And there is an upvote feature uh, within the Zoom Q&A link. So if you see a question uh, that you particularly uh, are interested in and we'd like to see us uh, try and include in the discussion, then do use the upvote feature and that will help uh, to signal to us which are the questions that are of most interest. Uh, and finally, in terms of housekeeping, uh, do uh, use uh, the hashtag reimaginegov uh, if you are tweeting uh, about uh, about the webinar today, which we encourage you to do. And of course, we encourage you to continue the conversation uh, on social media uh, afterwards as well. Uh, so I think that's that's all I need to do in terms of the overall uh, housekeeping and introduction. Uh, I'm going to invite uh, each each panel member to just introduce themselves uh, with one or two uh, minutes uh, speaking about both their background, but also their relationship to an experience with the topic of, of learning in government. So we'll go in the sequence. I, I introduce them briefly in a second, Angie, Nadal, and Ollie Pekka, and then we'll move into the main discussion. So first handing to you, Angie, welcome. Uh, great indigenous greetings from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the um, the traditional owners of Australia and the Torres Strait Islands and their connection, ongoing connection to their 
the, their land, their water and their people and all other First Nations uh, peoples across the world. I'm Angie Tangaidi, I am Ngāti Paro. I hail from the uh, tribe on the east coast of the North Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand and I was um, born and bred in South Auckland, very proud to be a South Aucklander I'm from Aotearoa and I am the kaitohu tangata whenua of the Auckland Co-Design Lab and um, I work alongside my kaitohu tangata tiriti, Dr Penny Hagen, in a leadership model that acknowledges and values the place of te tiriti and treaty in Aotearoa. Um, and our job, I think, in the co-design lab, um, the Auckland co-design lab, we're lucky to be connected to place, nested inside of Auckland Council alongside uh, the, the Southern Initiative, the Western Initiative, um, and working across um, central government agencies. But I think our job is to create the space for, for communities and whānau to create um, and lead the types of systems innovation that we need to learn into based on what they're telling us works in, um, for well-being in place. Um, and uh, for us, our passion is to return to indigenous knowledge systems to enable those spaces for whānau to lead innovation in place. And our second job is to help build government capabilities to enable and respond to what people and families are telling us will enable well-being in place. And for us, that is about understanding how do we learn into those capabilities as government, local and central, and move away from status quo and into what we need uh, to be doing to enabling well-being in place based on Indigenous knowledge systems, but also based on what people tell us matters in place. Kia ora. Thank you, Angie. Fantastic to have you with us. Uh, so handing over to Nyadol now. Welcome, Nyadol. Hi, I'm, I'm Nyaru Mnuon. Um, I currently uh, direct the Saz Elman Cohen Centre, which is a small um, uh, research and community engagement centre at uh, Victoria University. Um, and be before settling to Australia, um, I grew up in Kakuma, which is a refugee camp in Kakuma and came here with my family in 2005 um, uh, on humanitarian visa. Um, I, th I think I mean, I mentioned that background partly because I think that's why I'm interested in how communities that are defined as vulnerable um, are, are, are engaged with, um, and especially by government. Uh, my example of government learning, or perhaps the resistance to, <laughs> to government, government learning, uh, came at a role at the uh, Department of Justice. And... Um, and, and, and it, it was fundamentally around how the funding model uh, works. Um, and I think this is something probably that many communities that are, are defined as marginalized or vulnerable generally, generally experience, which is this uh, concept where their problems are contextualized by people who don't leave them. And then those people are also um, are provided with the resources to solve, to solve the, um, the problem. And so though there was significant funding going into you know, areas of dealing with um, uh, young people and, 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 uh, and community cohesion, a lot of that funding wasn't really going to community organizations doing the work. And, and government was, um, was resistant to, to engage in that space for obvious reasons that these communities were deemed as not having the capacity to be able to uh, manage um, government funding e efficiently um, and therefore there was questions of accountability um, that I think government was concerned uh, with but then that that created a number of problems the first is that it becomes circular so communities are not funded because they don't have capacity and they can't develop capacity without some, some sort of funding the second thing uh, that I think it does is, is that it 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 it's a disempowering model that doesn't ever empowers the communities to be able to um, actually participate in solving um, the, their problems. Um, instead, what then happened is that almost, you know, it's almost like there the, the exists a middle ground of, of, of people that become the community translators um, uh, for, for government to be able to understand and respond to needs. So one of the things we did was to to, to design a, a funding um, a funding uh, a funding project where um, instead and instead of um, instead of uh, having essentially completed and and well done um, uh, projects, we invite 
community organizations to uh, uh, make a, an expression of interest. And as a res uh, and, and at that stage, then uh, we identified 20 community organizations that were then assisted to refine that in order for it to be able to uh, meet uh, the standards of uh, uh, that government wanted. And the idea was that we were going to use the very process of funding itself as a capacity building um, opportunity. Um, and, uh, and it was good to see that the government, government was willing to change its mind and, and try that. But it also involved th thinking creatively about how do you mitigate government concerns like accountability issues um, as well. Um, and I think by uh, being able to um, not, not kind of ask for a lot of money, but fund sufficient, uh, provide organization with sufficient funding and then help them along the process, uh, was able to address some of those concerns. Uh, I mean, I hope this comes out in the discussion. Um, eventually, I think one of the problem with reimagining government um, uh, in a way that works for, for most of its citizens is that there's an automatic assumption about who has authority for what, you know, and, and I think um, we tend to see people with authority um, in a very narrow way, um, you know, certain members of our community don't always um, uh, enjoy the assumption that they can be um, an authority even on, on issues impacting them. And I think that really narrows the scope of uh, what, uh, what government can or think it can do. Thank you. Thank you, Nardo. Um, And I'm sure we will come on to that in the, in the discussion. We'll explore that more deeply. Um, and, and our final panelist uh, is uh, someone who's also like me on the European continent now. So it's, it's, Early morning for us, uh, uh, Oli Pekka, you're speaking to us uh, from Geneva, I believe. Welcome, Oli Pekka. Yes, thank you. Very happy to join. So in this session from um, Geneva, Switzerland, where I'm the Director General of the organization called International Baccalaureate, which is an uh, education organization providing education programs for children from three years to 19 years in 160 countries. Um, my main learning lessons for myself come from the Finnish society from Finland, where I'm originally from, having been in different positions in connection with public service as a, as a minister for eight years in three different governments as a member of the parliament, as a state secretary in five different ministries, and as a television director, and also the director general in the National Agency for Education. I've, I've had the kind of privilege to look how the public service is functioning from different perspectives. And what has for a long time, uh, been an inquiry for me is that why is it that the things that have once worked well don't seem to be functioning anymore, don't seem to be getting the outcomes that are expected. And that has led to kind of my thoughts of experimenting, uh, piloting new ways of doing things where you kind of build the traditional way of looking at, at the kind of a hierarchical way and the expectation of the, of the leading civil servants and the ministers have the right answers to everything which then will be implemented on a waterfall type to the, to the citizens, uh, kind of breaking that model and creating those learning loops in the in, in the system and also kind of having that humbleness on the government level to say that we don't know all the answers and we are happy to join together with the citizens to learn more what the main challenges are and then together start finding better solutions for tomorrow wonderful thank you um and I think it's it's also in the spirit of humility that we have this conversation because uh, the topic is is certainly, as we've heard from the introductions here, rich and varied, encompasses a lot, and we'll only be able to scratch the surface, I think, in the discussion. But let's let's kick things off 
uh, with a first question, uh, which is, I, I suppose, building on what we've already been talking about, whether, whether panelists can offer an example of what effective learning looks like that they've uh, that they've experienced in government um, and i'd like to to, to sort of add a little kicker to that question that picking up what niodol was saying about who, who gets to say what learning is and who gets to do the learning and and who's involved in that learning as it seems to be to be uh, uh, a very pertinent uh, consideration so angie maybe you can start us off what what does effective look like government learning look like and what, what have you experienced Oh, um, so um, so grateful to be on the line with Naya Dol and Ollie Pika and hear their their, their comments on uh, their experiences with government and learning. And um, I was really interested that Ollie Pika was saying what 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 once worked well um, is not working any uh, longer. In Aotearoa, the government government processes and systems never worked well for Māori and they continue not to work well for our most marginalised community. So it's only ever worked well for uh, the colonising population in Aotearoa, it's never worked well for us. Um, so for me, um, what learning looks like in the context of Aotearoa is to acknowledge that the, um, the Crown promise to uphold Te Tiriti in Aotearoa has never, um, they've never delivered on that promise. And so learning needs to look like that if we continue to do what we're doing in Aotearoa, that we will continue to embed and increase the inequities that Māori and other marginalised populations like our Pacifica whānau, our Pacifica families and refugee and migrant families experience here in Aotearoa. Um, and so for me, it means the learning system has to acknowledge we must move away from status quo now. Ali Pika was saying the same thing. We can't be doing the same thing and expect different results. Um, and that also means, as Ollie Picker was saying, um, we don't have the answers about what we need to be doing because we, because our systems are so entrenched in the colonial mindsets, values, and behaviours. Um, and so that's why the 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 role of learning is so critical for us right now. We're mandated in many ways to do things differently here in Aotearoa. We have uh, Te Tiriti Treaty, we've got um, policy and legislation mandates that tell us we must move into strength-based, Indigenous-led, family-centred ways of being and away from deficit, crisis-triggered, compartmentalised, siloed ways of working. So we've got the mandate, but our challenge is that we um, haven't developed the how, the practice to do that shifting at the moment. And so that's why we think he, at the co-design lab that the learning component is so critical to that. So as a, as a social innovation and learning platform, what we think we need to be doing is leaning into how do we build the capability in the system to learn in a fundamentally different way. And for us, that is a return to indigenous knowledge systems. Um, because as Nayadal was saying, very it's critical to uh, to interrogate who's holding power and control in these systems and what you'll find in that is that it isn't um, Indigenous people, it isn't uh, the marginalised um, communities of our, of, of, our, uh, of, our, of our country. And so part of that is thinking about how, who gets to, to determine value. So Nadal was talking about the funding models. And when you're determining value, you've got so much power and control across the system. Um, so a learning system looks like for me in the context of Aotearoa, acknowledge uh, the promise of Te Tiriti and that it has not been delivered on and acknowledge we must move away from status quo and acknowledge that um, indigenous knowledge systems have a powerful um, part to play in how we learn into the change and learn into the new capabilities of government, but also the, the, the role of people in place to be able to advocate for what well-being looks like for them and, and, and also to determine what the system um, capability or reorientation of system and therefore the capability changes and system change that needs to happen for our government systems to reorientate to enable the conditions that support well-being in place. Kia ora. Thanks, Angie. Good. One one quick follow up for you. It, 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 tell me if this is fair. Uh, uh, summary of what you're saying: our government systems, or at least your experience in, uh, in New Zealand, uh, I, I think you're implying that whilst obviously they're not they're not very capable at learning themselves, but they're actually preventing and or hold they're actually sort of smothering the existing knowledge. We already there's we have parts of the community maybe you know. Most 
people and, and most communities know how to uh, uh, how to explore and uh, learn and understand issues sort of deeply and innately. Uh, uh, but our government systems are sort of actually smothering that, preventing that, blocking that. So it's, it's not so much like learning how to learn, it's sort of unleashing the learning that already exists. Is that fair? Is that a fair characterization of what you said? Yes, and I, there's pockets of wonderful work happening, so I'm not saying that there is an advancement in this, but the, uh, si the system that we have is designed to embed the ideology that's uh, created it. And so those value sets are protecting themselves, um, and it's very difficult for other knowledge systems or other ways of working or being um, to influence those systems because they're designed, they're designed to pre protect themselves and the, the culture and the ideology that has, um, has created them. Yeah, so by default, you are protecting and embedding sometimes the things that are holding that inequity mm -hmm. in place. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Nairo, love, love to hear your, your re reactions to, to what Andrew was saying and also your own reflections on, on examples you've seen. Uh, when Andrew was talking, I was, I was thinking about, um, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping this is not a radical thing to say, but, but I think that change is, radical change is possible and <laughs> in, in, in a sense, but I think that um, uh, the, the problem is, is that the systems are not set to accept certain change so it's not only that you know in the case of first nation people or indigenous people the knowledge is not even being recognized um it's also the case that um new methods have to go through these system, systems and be deemed as valid and what comes out tend to reflect very much the limitations of the system weeding out which which parts it finds it finds too radical or too different and i think um, and I think as such, it's not the mechanism of each particular government or government department that becomes the problem. I think it's the overall framework, um, the overall questions about the society we want to create and who benefits from that society, who is deemed as acceptable within the society. So, um, and I think as, as much as those are, you know, very loose things and very hard things to pin down, I think they really end up influencing the outcomes of those institutions. So, you know, um, to to give you an example, you know, the 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 the, the lack of planning of long term government investment in certain areas, you know, how 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 that, of course, on one hand, it's res it responding to our democratic system of, you know. Um, elections and in Victoria we have elections every four years or, or something like that but that means technically that you have funding for programs or projects that last two to three three years mostly that before there's an election cycle and before everything becomes a, sort of almost an, an open debate and um, so you've got I think those systemic issues of government seeing themselves or having to see themselves and their and, and their role in you know, four four years periods, and I think that makes it very hard for long term for long term planning. And they ask questions about what kind of of independent models that can exist outside those government uh, systems that are, that can allow for that sort of almost long term long term planning, um, which becomes very difficult to to do. And then, of course, that system in itself is then highly politicized. You know, um, not not helped at all, uh, depending on which country you are. By, by the media media cycle. Um, and so even when you're dealing with, with, with government ability to respond to existing problem, sometimes you end up with government creating problems. Um, um, and so in Victoria, for example, in 2018, because of an election that was run on very racist grounds of African gangs, the you know, government was introducing this legislation to be seen as hard on, on, hard on crime, despite the fact that statistics were showing that you know, crime was actually in decline in Victoria. But in order to be seen as doing something, they 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 introduced these laws, the results of which was going to end up with higher incarceration of young people, uh, exactly the kind of young people that were being demonized on, on, on television. Um, so I think you've got that entire ecosystem. And again, I think if you step back just from the system, you can see a narrative about who belongs and who doesn't belong, who is protected and who is not protected, therefore who's who is offer solutions and who is prosecuted. So I think that's, that to me is the framework that limits um, 
some of the examples of the framework that limits the kind of, of government reimagining their interaction with community or particular sites of the community. And it, it then makes governing um, uh, a matter of extraordinary courage as opposed to almost an ad administrative process, right? Where government thinks critically about what needs to be impl implemented and, and, and therefore goes ahead and does it. Instead, you know, every decision that seems to be imaginative or outside the box become a, probably a political football to be attacked or something else and need justification. And so, as I say, governance become, you know, an extraordinary act in uh, of, of um, of, of doing things as opposed to it being normal. I, mean, I don't know how we change that genuinely um, uh, as as um, as as communities. Um, uh, but 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 I, I think that they're just old problems taking new shape um, in in our modern society. Um, and and so some of the work really to reimagine communities. Uh, and people, some people might disagree, but in my view, I think some of the most innovative work to reimagine, to reimagine community or community action is no longer happening in government. It's actually happening in local communities. So in, in, in Australia, it, when you'd see some of the most innovative work around climate change, it's not happening in government anymore because government has kind of become stuck in climate wars. So what you're seeing more and more is communities um, developing models for, 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 for responding to these problems. Um, um, and I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure how that exists. I suppose the only the only suggestion I, I sort of have, and I think one of the speaking speaking points for this presentation was to think radically, um, is to is to have well, the ability to, to identify key issues that, as a society, we think need to be a little bit above politics or whatever, you know. And it could be things like education, which will not be, and and finding ways of you know. Uh, mechanism that still are, that, that mechanism that still are accountable to the voters, but allow for the long term planning, allow to minimize the, um, the, the the partisanship that has sipped so much into almost every decision of government now, um, uh, and 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 to model uh, ideas of society and response to societal issues. I'm not sure if I've you know I answered your question. I feel a bit it's a bit a bit, bit loose, but yeah, that's that's where my thinking. No, is. that's. That's wonderful, Nardal. And you said you were going to be provocative. I haven't been provoked yet, so I I wait I wait uh, a provocation. But maybe I can tempt you to say something here by with a follow up, which is I think you I think you did answer your own question in the sense that you said uh, you know why why is government getting involved I think in in the minutiae when that could be handed to communities when communities themselves are better equipped are better. Um, oriented don't have the same political and uh, electoral cycle and media considerations as the higher levels of government. So is, your, is it fair to say that your point is simply, you know, we should be handing the decision, a lot of the decision making around the things that we perhaps should be learning about is not is, are being held at levels of government where that's just inappropriate, is that and, and then and, and it should be given given to the community or uh, somehow, um, uh, the community should be uh, invited to to sort of take the leadership role in that, rather than government taking the role. Yeah, I don't know because I think also the question of whose community is contested at the moment, right? I think it depends. Oh, it depends on which country you are. Like, you know, um, if you're gay or or lesbian, um, some people don't think you 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 are part of their community that belongs. Then, in fact, that you should be prosecuted, you know. So, or if you're black, you know. So, who who is community is also quite a contested uh, notion. So, I think yeah, I'll be afraid to some degree if we are handing these things to community. Um, that doesn't mean that it it resolves the problem itself. I think what I was talking about is that government has always have accountability mechanism in 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 some forms. You know, we've got you know ombudsman. We've got things like the you know. Um, the, the, the Freedom of Information Act, this idea of creating visibility and accountability outside of government. Um, the, 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 what I'm suggesting is whether there is a version of that that can mm. assist um, to, it's not gonna take it all away, but can assist in, in reducing some of the short-term thinking, highly partisan thinking um, that, um, that has now, I think, eroded a lot of government ability ability to act. I think, I think, yeah, I think communities, some communities, I mean, I'm careful about it, but I think communities do amazing work with the, with the little they have. And I think communities will always respond um, 
in, in to protect other members that they identify belong in the commun community. I think that's where the, the act, the, 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 you know, when you see um, neighbors donating and looking after each other after a huge climate crisis, while, while government help is still a long way away. I think that comes from that sense that we we belong together. We know what we are we're suffering from, and and, and that 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 is not something that's necessarily triggered by money or resources or or that. Not not saying that they. In my view, I think there's a disparity in 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 what government funds and who governments fund. So I think there's a disparity in in that, and that needs to be corrected. Um, uh, but but I think you know. Uh, maybe the beauty and 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 the and 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 the concern is it, to me the beauty at least is that I, I believe that communities would always turn up for each other, um, when 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 especially marginalized community when 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 they need when they need help or when each other needs help and that's never that's not going to entirely rely on government decision making although government good government response can really enhance the efficientness and the and the scope. Of, of the reach of such help. Thank you. Thank you, Nadal. Well, Oli Pekka, I don't want to sort of paint paint a caricature of you here, but I think you're you're sort of the best representative on this panel anyway of of gov of the sort of federal central level of government, given your experience working at those levels in Finland. I think we've heard both from Angie and Nadal um, a fairly comprehensive uh attack i would suggest on the on the the institutions that we that we've built at the, at the top levels of government really they're not representative they're pushed back and forward by media and political interests they don't understand the communities that they're trying to serve um what's your what's your response to all of that given your experience and the work that you've done well well i think that the 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 attack by by uh, Angie and, and, and Nidal is a fair one. Uh, I, I do kind of agree that we have seen those, that type of challenges and are seeing them still today um, in, in the way that government functions. The, the kind of change that we're talking here is it's not only about how you do things or what you do, but it's really about why, why governance? And you have to start with the purpose that what is it that that governance is for? And that's a, it's a very deep, that, that's a radical question. It goes to the root of the uh, professional identity and the way that also kind of citizens and voters are used to seeing uh, their representatives on a parliament or on a, on a government level. And that has to change also. Um, and, and the kind of, it's really shifting away from the two ways of making change, either by power or by kind of rationality, which are both kind of top-down met methods that somebody else knows best to that learning uh, way of making change. And I would like to offer maybe kind of three snapshots that give me hope uh, for the change, uh, because I think uh, in order to make a change in the current system, we have to be able to show that there's a way that works better. And my first snapshot is that when I was the state secretary in the prime minister's office, I had the privilege to organize for the government one whole day where all the ministers at that time from five different parties spent a day together. There were two short presentations in the beginning about systems thinking and complexity thinking. And after that, we let, that there was an agenda. There was no kind of political items that were discussed, but just for them to reflect on their own work. And, and it was an amazing day, cause they kind of, they intuitively understood 
the kind of systems and complexity thinking very strongly. And, and we also noticed that there were no kind of party lines in that discussion. So, so there is that capability, but for having the courage to take it into use, then we have to come to the kind of meta principles or meta rules of the system that need to be changed. My second snapshot comes from the education sector where we, <clears throat> we made a decision to start to act differently. And what we did is that we didn't kind of start to create the solutions during the pandemic period that what schools should do, but we called the schools from the uh, National Agency for Education and asked that what, what are your main challenges? Is there something that we can do in order to help you? And the first reaction was that, what have we done wrong? There's somebody from this central agency calling us. But after that, it opened up and we were able to create true learning processes and bring together, like for example, pretty often the challenges were in connection with the well being of young people. And then bring together on the local level all the different actors that had a say on the well being of young people, and of course, young people themselves being in the center of those discussions. And once kind of the different authorities also around the table uh, kind of had the courage to say that, I don't know how this should be solved. Then things started to happen. Then there was the openness to learn new things, to learn from the problem, and also kind of share your expertise in a way with others that could create something new. The third snapshot is that uh, we did that at, uh, a, a kind of a process of which lasted about two years, where we brought in the education system all the different actors in different layers around the same table. Finland is such a small country that it's possible to be done there. And what what we did is that we really started seeing that are there kind of shared goals that we would all agree on? And kind of my role, I, I was the chair of that process. My role was very strongly to take care that there is a process of learning which everyone has agreed to and that we are going to stick to that process, no matter what happens on the way. So kind of creating trust among the different actors to be able, maybe also give up something on their own view in order for us all together to reach something better. And very, very important thing in doing that is the question that, I should not have a kind of system convener in a way of, the, of, of what I was doing. I, I, I could not have any agenda of my own. Because if I would have had that, then the trust would have been kind of ruined. But kind of staying open with the fact that this is something that we are doing together we are finding together the solutions and this is the process was the kind of central piece of doing it. And I, I think it was a, a wonderful learning process, which also make the system visible for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Ole Pekka, for that. It, my, uh, my thought as you were speaking is that what you're describing is, is a very um, purposeful set of actions to shape conversations to shape processes to shape mindsets or to help people explore their mindset in relation to learning so that that learning is not 
um, a byproduct or a nice to have or something that maybe will emerge from the from if we're lucky, uh, if we get the right people who happen to be on the right mood that day. But a very, very a lot of effort and, and thought and, and 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 stewardship from you and from others in in thinking about how to set that stage so that learning can take place. Is that um, am I am I summarise that correctly? We we have at, at CPI, I think, as as you know, Ali Pekka, we've talked about this. We have a principle which we believe is important to to government around optimising for learning rather than control. But to optimise for learning, that is that is there's a lot to be done to optimise for learning rather than control. Is is that does that get to the heart of what you're you're reflecting on, Ali Pekka? It, it definitely does, and. Um... And one thing that we have to rethink and maybe kind of unlearn something about it also is the question of leadership. Uh, and, and there, the main issue, because often leadership is, set, is kind of seen as something connected to a person. But in a learning system, leadership must be and should be spread in the system as widely as possible so that kind of the best situation would be that everyone would feel empowered to have that accountability and ability to lead to lead on their side the the course of how things are moving forward and and kind of being doing that then we come again also to the trust issue that, that there has to be the, the the credibility the reliability and also the closeness of the of, of what's happening in different layers in governance i think like like many of the challenges that um that nidal was referring to i think they are also connected of that there's a two big distance between the national government and what's happening on the local level. So there is not an understanding what the challenges really are. And there's the idea that we push the national policies and strategies down, but they might not be actually helping the problems that there are on the local level. So, so the intimacy in creating trust is also a very central Thank you, Oli Pekka. So, and I think uh, I think the question of trust as well, like trust is such a, um, uh, again, speaking in, in terms of Australia, the, the, the lack of trust in institutions and in, in, in courts, in the, in, in especially among politicians and the media um, is so high. So there's a question as well as how do you rebuild, rebuild that, that, that trust um, uh, between those, governing and, and the govern. Um, I think that's another, yeah, that's another big problem as well. Nadal, do you feel that uh, there are efforts to try and rebuild that trust, that this is an issue that people recognize and are focused on and are purposeful about in the, in this, in the way that Oli Pecker was describing the Finnish case study, there was a purposefulness about learning anyway. Do you, do you think that's the case or do you think that this issue is, is, is really not not being addressed in a meaningful way enough way i think we are aware we're certainly aware we're asking the i mean it, it, it's there in the public debate that there's a lack of trust in in in, in especially about, uh, in, in politicians and the media and to me these are two critical um uh, uh, systems or institutions right you've got you've got those doing the governing and those telling our stories telling us our story about what we are as a nation or you know or how our systems operate and when there's no trust in those two um people don't see the society as functioning for them um and they find others to blame uh so i i think there's an there's an there's there's an there's it's being admitted but it in in my understanding, maybe my limited understanding, it, it's almost as if these two systems have become self-executing. Like people have been caught up in the models of what produce the same kind of leaders, the same kinds of, you know, the same kind of news story. So in the news cycle, you've ended up with this clickbait um, 
in uh, system of misinformation and, and entertainment more than learning or education. And then in government, or whether responding to that media cycle or in or for other reasons, you ex essentially have th the same. I think it's worse in certain countries um, than, uh, and we can see what's happening in the United States to the point that it leads to, to, to violence. Um, and then because they've almost become self-executing, I think it becomes very hard for people to know which part do you need to break to break the cycle. Because um, you, you know, for the politicians, you don't want to lose an election. And, and for those in the media, uh, there is an economic imperative to keep doing this. So I don't, I, I, I don't know how you challenge that. And I think a lot of the challenge, again, is it's happening outside of it. It's happening um, through citizen journalism or as what we saw in the federal election through grassroots independent movements, you know, with, with uh, the main political parties both losing to this new emerging um, form of consensus, consensus, consensus building that is outside what we've seen in the, in the, main, in the mainstream. So it's not hopeless. I think, I think what I have to say that it's not hopeless. I think some of the most complex and difficult problems in the world have always looked impossible, but somehow people have, have managed to, to change them. I don't think it is, it is impossible, but I think it gives us all a sense of, well, in a, at least for those of us in Australia, it gives you this sense of a crisis, you know, a constant sense of things are not going well. There's no immediate reaction to issues of climate change. There doesn't, uh, most of the um, solutions being proposed don't seem either adequate for, for, for what is being asked that needs to be done. And so you just carry this sense of, of crisis around, not understanding fully where the solutions are going to come, come from. Um, someone did ask a question though, and I know time is running away about whether or not I unradicalize my, my. Yes, please respond to that one. Yes, all the time, right? But I, but I think I, you know, for two reasons. One of the reasons why I, you know, I, you know, unradicalize or my opinion is because sometimes, you know, my my opinions or my views are just not correct. You know, and I haven't thought about them well enough, and I need to 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 step back and rethink and rethink of them. But sometimes it's because to even be heard in certain spaces, you have to do that. Otherwise, you seem. Um, not just without credibility, but crazy, you know? So, so, so you have to almost step back and, and speak in the language of institutions and speak in the language of acceptability in order to win some gain um, uh, uh, that, that you think doing that would work. So for example, going back to the projects that I was talking about with the Department of Justice, you know, what I would have found interesting, what I would have done if I was being tremendously radical, is identify community organizations that have been doing really good work for a long time and have not been given any money and just give them money to continue that work without any hustle about reporting, with the, to trust that they know what is best for their community, you know, and that they've done that and shown it. Um, and that, you know, to trust that they will, they, they will do the right thing. But I, appreciating in my, in my place, at least that, you know, uh, the, the minister has to demonstrate that they are accountable for taxpayers' money. You have to reduce that dream to the systems and the processes. So instead of let's give this community 50 to 100 Ks, you know, to continue working with, you know, these 20 young people, giving them a place to go and play, actually, let's give them 10 Ks, you know, let's give them 10,000 and then let's monitor, you know, the 10,000 through the process. So that's you almost unradicalize your, your idea to be able for it to be, um, yeah, to fit the bites of what the system can swallow. That, that's that's such a fascinating uh, tension, and, and and clearly you you can see pros and cons to sort of unradicalizing it. Yeah, maybe maybe we should be fighting for the the hundred thousand or the million of un, of unrestricted funding rather than uh, sort of. Uh, uh, trying to fit fit our our arguments to the to the system, but completely understand the, the logic of doing so. Angie, right, sorry, is this I'm what? Is, can I oh, go really quickly though. I think I think yes. On one hand, we treat community organisations like that, but in Australia during COVID nineteen, government was willing to give business so much money without mm -hmm. much accountability, and we found out later that most of these businesses never lost profit during COVID-19 and they still got to keep the money. So there is a question about where government is willing to take risk. And we are seeing more and more 
in society that are predominantly described in economic terms, that government is willing to take risk in business, but not risk with people. Yes. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, an example from COVID-19, to abuse my position here slightly, it, it, from, from the UK that I found particularly striking was when, uh, when families who would normally be benefiting from free school meals, but ch the children were not going to school, and that problem was pointed out, the government didn't simply say, let's send £20 a week to those families, so that they, which was the cost of the school meal. They, bought, they got a private sector organisation to send a food package, which was then criticised for being completely inadequate and, 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 and not very nutritious and the rest of it, which is exactly the point you're making, I think, in Nidal, is like, why, why would we trust a, the private sector to do this and not just trust people who've got kids to buy food for them by, by giving them that money? It seems remarkable. Um, Angie... You, so we've, you've heard a, a lot there from Ollie Pecker and then from and from, from Nadal. Do you think Nadal's characterization of of uh, of sort of unradicalizing or, or being being somehow the broker between these different systems is is that is that how you see your role? Is that is that helpful or how how do you respond to what you've heard? I mean, I think what we've been trying to do is to collapse the distance between centralised power and community voice and family voice. So much uh, in the past, perhaps we've been trying to elevate the voice of our communities and uh, particularly our Indigenous communities and our young people um, in terms of insight. But now what we would see our role is much more uh, about curating spaces where we have those communities and those young people, um, those families speaking directly to power. So it's curating the, a platform uh, where they're seen as equal, equal experts in understanding what we need to be doing differently and how, how government should be responding, um, responding in a different way. But I'll just touch on a couple of things that Ali Pika said, and I was just really interested in what Naya Dahl was saying as well. Um, I'm really fascinated, and, and we're trying to um, develop learning platforms where we do these learning loops, similar to what Ali Pika was talking about, to help people to do some deep learning really quick inside of government about, you know, what can we start to do radically different. Um, and this is really important because some of the challenges, and we never got to question two, but this is my answer for question two, um, was like what's stopping us from being able to learn is that we can't imagine another way of being and doing than what we've got. We can't reimagine ourselves. So you have to create those compelling alternatives or you have to demonstrate how things are radically different. As Naya Dahl was saying, many communities are doing that in spite of government, they've carried on. They've got intergenerational well-being plans, 100, 100 generations into the future about how they're gonna look after their people. So they're doing that already, but our challenge is how do we support um, the learning process, the learning loop, so people can be vulnerable to say, I don't know what the answer is. Uh, building the trusted relationships for people to be able to do that, and then being able to demonstrate what that looks like in principle. And for us, it starts in place with the people who know what's best for themselves. Indigenous people, communities that knows what's that know what is working, what's strength based, what's already in place that works for people. So it's about how do we do those learning loops and and how do we create those spaces for people to do that learning and and be vulnerable and understand I don't I don't have the answer. And one of those things is dismissing the assumption that the best people to do this innovation are sitting inside of the system around the centralized power institutions that we have and saying, you know, the answers are sitting out in our community, they're sitting in other knowledge systems. Um, and a couple of other things that we've been really um, leaning into um, and ho hoping we can learn our way um, into a different way of being is, we can't simplify our way out of these complexities. We cannot come compartmentalize, we cannot silo, we cannot simplify these um, amazingly complex issues. We, we have to create ways of, of embracing that complexity. And Oli Pika talked about having a, a purpose Having purpose, building trusted relationships is a way to start to embrace that complexity and trying to, instead of trying to simplify, simplify your way out of it by creating programs or initiatives from a centralized power base that then get rolled out, um, get rolled out to, um, to community. And that's what we're interested in is what's, what's the learning process for us to reverse engineer all of those assumptions and processes, start in place, 
um, and, and, and value other knowledge systems and, and acknowledge it. But this is really deep work. This is That kind of systems change is really challenging people on their values set and on, on what they're bringing in terms of bias. Um, and the last thing I'll just say on based on what Naya Dahl was just saying then is, you know, it would be valid to have a deep mistrust of the government if you're an Indigenous person living in Aotearoa, given the, the track record there of inequity and um, um, and and, and um, the discrimination that people experience right now. And unfortunately for us, that keeps showing up in all of the things that government are researching and, and, and actually exposing for themselves. For example, the race, racial pro profiling that's been happening but, um, through our police force. So, so it's not just that we've got a mistrust, but that mistrust is embedded and in, in embedded in the way that um, our institutions um, continue to behave um, and the processes that are embedded in those um, institutions. So for me, it's about how are we learning our way out of that? And how, but firstly, how are we acknowledging this is a gross, this is a gross inequity and this is a, a gross injustice for our people, firstly, as a system. And then, and then how do we become vulnerable enough? And, and you know, you guys have talked about it, Ali Pika and Nayadal. Our systems are so risk averse, they will only protect themselves in these instances. So until we can uh, um, address that and find other ways of learning and doing and being in a different way, as Ollie Pekka was saying, which is much more purpose um, um, focused, um, then we're just going to keep reverting back to what we're doing. Kia ora. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. And uh, unfortunately, I'd, I'd love this conversation to go on for an, for at least another <laughs> at least another hour. But unfortunately, we've come to the end of this hour. It's gone very very quickly, so I'm going to draw it to a close here. Um, I'm not going to attempt to to summarise the richness of the of the conversation that that we've just been having, and 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 I'm sure we'll continue to have uh, uh, on social media and in other spaces afterwards. Um, other than to say, I think we've heard a lot about the challenges. This, this is an enormous issue. It, it, it sounds perhaps simple on the face of it. How can government learn? But it, it reveals, and I think what our panelists have done an excellent job of doing is it, it peels back the layers of power and colonialism and the institutional basis upon which decision making is made, the politics, the media. We've heard all how this is a complex, complex system and therefore it's extraordinarily difficult to sort of unpick it really but we've also heard i think from all of our panelists hope hope that there are examples of how this is happening differently there are examples of how even at the top top levels of government as Ali pekka shared we found different ways of having different conversations and reorienting towards towards being being humble and uh, and learning um and so there is hope there is hope this is how i'd like to to end this one um, thank you so much uh, to our three panelists, to Angie, to Nardole, to Oli Pekka for sharing so so generously and and openly their experiences. Um, really, really appreciate uh, you, you taking the time today. This has been a wonderful conclusion, a wonderful conclusion to the Reimagining Government webinar series this year. Thank you uh, to everybody who's been listening. And, uh, and, and apologies if we didn't get to your question and you, you posted it online. We'll be sending out uh, an evaluation survey and welcome feedback from, from, uh, from all of you. Check out uh, also the materials hub on our website, which has a, a lot more on some of the topics we've been talking about. Uh, case studies on learning is a topic we at CPI are pursuing all the time uh, and, and uh, the, we'll share a link in the chat here to, to take you to that. And also, Consider joining our Slack community of practice where this conversation continues and we get deeper into the topics that we've been discussing, not just in this webinar, but in, in the whole series. Um, so thank you very much. We're on the hour. I really appreciate, again, uh, all the panelists and everyone who's joined. Uh, and uh, wherever you are in the world, have, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.